Howdy, howdy. We're going to be uh, talking about soil water for a long time, so buckle up. Um, hopefully you got your shovels out as part of your career. It's important. Uh, too many people try to understand stuff that grows in the soil without ever even thinking about it. So we're going to be talking about this uh, really important issue of soil water and how it moves through and is as uh, stored in soils. So um, let's get started. Um, soils are extremely variable. I, you know, we, we see color is kind of the biggest thing you can see, but if we if we look at soil profiles, they're very different. Uh, we have different types of soils from all over the all over the United States and all over the world. Indeed, um, we get different these soil profiles with different horizons. You guys have all studied that uh, in in the soils class, which you don't need to go through that again. Just other than we just get all these different kinds of layers and horizons, we call them, and they behave differently, and it affects how uh, water moves through soils. So. Uh, soils, uh, they develop over time. They start off as being very young, immature soils over there on the right. Um, you know, they don't support a lot of plant life. Um, and as they get older, they, they tend to develop, they, they break down, they get smaller in size, they have better water and nutrient holding capacities, uh, they're deeper, et cetera. Um, again, we get all these, you know, 12 different soil orders that have different properties. Uh, here's some pictures of of these different uh, soils, lots of cool stuff out there, um, you know, that gets me excited. Uh, one of the things that really does impact how water moves through soils and the stored by so soil is uh, soil texture, which we're, we're all familiar with. Uh, we get all these different uh, soil textural categories that we've learned about previously. Uh, just a reminder that soil particle size gives rise to the texture of the soil. We have you know, starting with the largest thing, gravel, which actually doesn't contribute to texture. We don't count rocks, but uh, the sand, which is bigger than clay, which is, or excuse me, bigger than silt, that's bigger than clay. Soil depth is really important too. In fact, when we're talking about the urban environment, it's just really critical because a lot of the soils that we study and we look at as agricultural soils that tend to be deeper um, urban soils tend to be pretty shallow, pretty compacted. So it's kind of a different ball game. We really have to manage them very differently. So it affects uh, in, a, in a serious way, uh, water movement through soils. Uh, soil structures is uh, important too. Um, that's related to texture sometimes, but it's different than texture. We get different uh, processes that affect the structure of a soil, how, how those soils are put together basically how much pore space is really is kind of the thing that we're looking at because pore space is what water has to move through so that that's really important and all of these things can affect that so here's here's a little diagram uh, i'm taking most of these slides from a really great book uh, if you're going to be doing much technical work with with drainage i would highly recommend this book by mcintyre jacobson uh, a couple of aussies uh, uh, written in 2000. It's called Practical Drainage for Golf, Sports, Turf, and Horticulture. And these guys really sharp. And, and, and it's written not too technical. So it's I highly recommend it. Anyway, we get these different soil particles, different sizes again. And then we get this, this pore spaces that, that exist between them. And again, that's where water moves through soils. Um, we get to uh, different different sizes. You know, here's kind of some some you know things if we if if uh, we have likened clay to a, a grain of salt, which it's actually much, much, much smaller than a grain of salt, but just, you know, we can relate to the size of a grain of salt. Uh, you know, very coarse sand would be the size of a soccer ball. So we get some, some differences in soil sizes. Now, this, this is kind of intuitive that we talk about hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic conductivity is water movement through a soil. And so we're looking, if we look at speed, and, and, if, and if it's just texture, like if, if kind of everything else is, is equal, um, basically the bigger the particle sizes, the faster water will move through. So if I have just straight gravel, water moves through that very quickly. If I have just straight clay, water does not move through it. It's just those pores are so small that water just won't even move through, through pure clay. And so now, now soils aren't usually all clay or all sand. There's usually a mixture in there. And plus we have structure on top of that and other things. So, so this is a little bit of a simplistic thing, but it's, it's, you know, it's good to know. Um, 
We get uh, sand-based soil. We get this, what we call bridging or jigsaw effect with the sandy loam. Sandy loams are some of the worst ones. So even though they're sandy, we think, oh yeah, water should move through that very good. Not always, because they're very, very prone to compaction. Um, we get the picture of, uh, we're gonna look at these, uh, of aggregated soil versus a pile of unaggregated soil. Um, so here, here we go, sorry about that. Um, let, let's just kind of look at this water in the pore space. So, so these molecules of water have attraction. They're, they're attracted to each other, which are the forces of cohesion. Uh, and then we have the forces of adhesion, which are, are water attracted to the surfaces of solids, such as soil. So this is a diagram of this. Over here on the, the left, we got water molecules attracted to each other, and they kind of form a chain, so to speak. And then over here on the right, we've got these forces of, of adhesion being attracted to the soil particles. And then we get this, we get them kind of climbing up, which is gonna come in, uh, into play here in a minute, but, but they're attracted strongly to the wall of the soil. And we call this the meniscus. The meniscus is the edge where the water is, is at. So we, we, we've seen that probably in chemistry classes when we have a thin glass tube and we have water that, will, that was, is sitting in there. We can see the meniscus of, of water in that. We'll show you a diagram of that here in a minute. But, um, but we get that same thing happening in the soils as, as the water kind of is attracted to it. So this water molecule is sitting higher than the, than the highest one over here because of the forces of adhesion that are pulling it up. So in that, that allows water to move through soils through these forces. Um, another thing that's kind of important here is we get what we call armored water. Um, I, I like to call armored water. It, it's caused by hydrophobicity. Uh, these water droplets are sitting on the surface of a very hydrophobic sand. That sand is, is, is repelling water, hydrophobic. Phobic means it's afraid of, right? So hydro is water, so it's afraid of the water, pushes the water away, doesn't want the water to come in, even though it's the sand. So if a, if a sand or, or any soil really, but mostly sands is, is where it happens, uh, becomes so dry, it can become hydrophobic. We, we're more commonly used to seeing that with peat moss. If you buy peat moss that's dry, it's extremely hydrophobic. Now, normally peat moss has a huge water holding capacity, but when it's really dry, hydrophobic. Once it gets wetted up, yeah, no problem. It'll, it'll just take the water and it'll absorb it, to, okay. But when it's hydrophobic, it's a problem. So soils, soil particles can do that same thing. All right, um, so let's let's look at figure two two here um, out of this book. Again, we talk about this meniscus uh, bending with gentle pressure, and if we push something in deep enough, it actually breaks with more pressure. Um, so that what what does that have to do with anything? Well, we get that same effect in the soil. So if we look here, water is held by surface tension on the particles against the force of gravity. Um, now, now the water that's sitting out here in the middle, like, like see right here in these, in these voids, like out there in the middle, there's a big space. We call that a macro pore. And in and, and the macro pores, there's just not, they're not close enough to a soil particle for those soil particles to kind of hang on to the water. So the water will drain from the macro pores. We remember we call that gravitational water. Uh, water that'll drain out of the soil in basically, you know, 24 hours, maybe a little more, maybe less, but it'll move out of the soil after it's saturated. But this water that's up next to the soils that's close, it'll actually be held at, at stronger than the force of gravity because of those forces of adhesion and cohesion. All right, now, when the soil is saturated, the menisci are flat, like this here on the left, when it's full of water. However, as the soil drains due to gravity pulling down water downward, the meniscus bend downward and inward and become stronger. So those forces increase, increasingly hold on to the water as the soil has less and less of it. So this, this is important. So when it's really you know, dry, like it's at the, you know, the permanent wilting point, for example, the, the, not even plants can pull that water away. Uh, so, and plants, are, plants have more force and gravity does, but but that gets so so strongly held when it, when the soil is really dry. There's still water there, but but gravity can't move it, and plants can't extract it, and not even the sun can pull all of it away. The only way to really get rid of all of it is to put it in an oven at super hot temperatures and drive it off. 
Okay, let's look at some different scenarios. Um, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with uh, with uh, scenario A right here. Um, I've got a uh, typical environment in the urban environment. I've got a, a shallow topsoil over a slow draining base that's compacted. It, so what happens is we build some building or whatever, and we kind of drive over the soil and destroy it. Um, and then we bring in some topsoil and put it on top. That's pretty common, and it's usually fairly shallow. So that's what we've got here. Now, we flood the soil. We, we've got rain. It's coming down really hard, or we're irrigating. Uh, the soil is dry, but we get this wetting front. So it's saturated at the soil surface. The wetting front is here and it's dry down below. Well, with time, that saturated water keeps moving down. The wetting front, there's less and less dry soil. Um, eventually, that water will start, uh, can, it'll continue to move down uh, potentially. If it's saturated, uh, it'll move. And then, but the surface becomes non saturated. So we've got this, this we, we kind of want to think, oh, the soil is either saturated or it's not saturated. Reality is it, there's, there, it can vary depending on how much time, the depth of the soil, where I'm at. Uh, here's uh, scenario D now, where I basically moved all of the saturated water is sitting down. Now it's just sitting on top of that slow draining base. It's not really going into it because that base is so compacted. Uh, we're really not moving water into it. it it's kind of acting like a bathtub holding up water. Uh, so we get this saturated zone just sitting there and it's non-saturated up above. Um, now, if we put more water on, we can saturate the whole thing here in, uh, in scenario E. All right, now this is a little complicated. Um, so let, let's, let's look at this graph. Take a second here. I, I'm looking at infiltration rate. That, so that's how fast does water move into the soil? And so we wanna think of a soil having a certain infiltration rate, but the reality is, that changes depending on soil moisture conditions. And, and so the initial rate can be very high. So we got on the y-axis here, we've got the, the infiltration rate in millimeters per hour. There's, and so just, you know, for those of us who are used to dealing in English units, um, uh, you know, there's 25 millimeters is a 2.5 centimeters, which is one inch. So uh, one inch up here, 25 mill millimeters. And so if we apply some irrigation water to the soil, um, you know, initially it's, it's extremely fast. Now in, in scenario A, the soil is at the grass stress point, which means it's really dry. So initially, um, I, you know, I've got very high rates and it, and it goes, the water goes in very quickly. Now, as it, as it, those pores fill up, it slows down. I mean, it's got less uh, space to go into. And there's less force pulling it in. And so there's that scenario. B is when I'm irrigating or it's raining at field capacity. So it's slower at, at when I'm at field capacity. And so it's going to potentially run off easier. And then, of course, here's when uh, C is when the soil is saturated. So when it's saturated, the, the infiltration rate is the same all the way across there in scenario C. So in this particular case, the saturated infiltration rate is five millimeters per hour, which is one fifth of an inch. That's, that's as much as it'll take. And if I'm trying, you know, and so if it's raining, um, you know, and if it's raining more than five millimeters an hour and, and as well, I'm assuming there's somewhere for it to drain, that's really as much as it's gonna take at maximum. You know, and if it fills up, if it's got a slow draining base below and it's got nowhere to go, it'll run off anyway. But, but let's just say it's infiltrating and it's continuing to move on down through the soil. That's, that's the, the most it will take is about a fifth of an inch per hour uh, or five millimeters uh, when it's saturated. And, and what, where's the rest of it gonna go? Well, it's gonna run off. It's gonna go down the storm drains, uh, move to lower spots in the landscape, puddle up wherever, that's what happens. But initially, you know, we're sitting up uh, much higher, like 25, you know, one inch per, per hour. Uh, so that's, that's important to realize, really important co uh, component of, of soil water. All right, now. Let's look at this. This is uh, different types, soil types. We're going to look at uh, soil moisture content at the time of irrigation. We got the four different scenarios here. In uh, we got the permanent wilting point, which is really dry, the visible grass stress point, the field capacity, and then I've got the top of the, the profile is saturated. So what does this say? Well, in this particular sandy loam, if we look at inches per hour, um, when I'm really dry, it's actually taking in this sandy loam. It's taking 4.8 inches per hour. 
As, as it's sat, it becomes saturated, it goes down to 2.4 inches per hour. Now let's jump down all the way to the bottom. This is a silt clay. Um, it's it's going to only take 0.3 inches per hour, even when the soil is extremely dry at the permanent wilting point. When it's when it's saturated, it is it's almost not taking any water at all. 0.04 uh, inches per hour. So so soil texture can be a very important factor in infiltration rate. Now this is another complicated thing here. Um, we get this, this is a water retention curve. And th this particular soil is a loamy, a, a loamy soil, which is kind of typical, typical type of a soil. Now the water in between the field capacity and saturation is removed by gravity. Again, that's the gravitational water. But water in the soil between field capacity and the permanent wilting point can only be removed by plants and evaporation, right? So we call that re review here. That is the plant available water. Remember, between field capacity, permanent wilting point, that's my plant available water. So, so as we look at when I'm at the wilting point, now, now I'm looking at uh, suction. Now, what, what am I talking about suction? Well, we've, we've talked about that in, in soils and hopefully you have some memory of that, but just kind of in review. When a soil is down here and it's saturated, there's, there's no suction. In other words, the soil exerts no force. You think about it as like a straw, like you're, you're, you're sucking on a straw, right? Um, you know, and if it's, if it's very liquidy, you know, you don't have to really suck too hard to get, you know, water up out of there, right? Um, but, you know, as, as something gets dry, you really got to, you know, suck hard to get stuffed up through the straw. So it's kind of, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> but um, anyway, suction is a measurement of, uh, you know, how much force is being held by uh, on the soil. And so you can see here, uh, saturation, it is very, very uh, uh, no suction. Um, right here at the air entry point, um, it's about 100. At field capacity, it's about 1,000. And at the wilting point, it's 150,000. So we're so we're, this is kind of going from saturation to really dry as we're here on the y-axis. Now over here on the x-axis, I'm looking at the water content in in terms of the percent of the total volume of the soil. So if we kind of look at this this curve, you know, it starts off here. I'm at the wilting point. Um, I've got about 10% water. Um, as as I go down the curve here. Um, you know, this, all this water in here is only being removed by plants and evaporation. I get down here and I hit this field capacity. Um, now we're starting to not only have water taken up by plants and evaporation from the sun, but also we're losing some by gravity. And then this here is, is this point where we've kind of basically lost our air and we've now hit saturation. Now this is, I know it's complicated, but we're gonna kind of come back to this idea here as we continue to move through this. Um, another point that's here is the top of the capillary fringe and the bottom of the capillary fringe. We're, we're going to come to that explanation in just a minute as well. All right. Um, now, th this, so, he so here's this concept. Let let's say I go out there and I dig a hole. Um, maybe it's a well, uh, or maybe I'm putting in a cup for a golf green, um, whatever it is. Uh, so I dig this hole. And I'm, I'm digging down into the saturation. So, so we've, we've saturated the soil. It's moved down. I'm sitting here on top of my slow draining base again, right? So up here, this is non-saturated soil that's at the top. But the saturated water has moved down. It's just kind of sitting there, sitting up on top of there. And it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there. So we call that the saturation zone. The saturation zone is split into two parts. We get what's called the capillary fringe and then the free water zone. Now in the free water zone, there's enough hydraulic pressure. So what is hydraulic pressure? It's an important concept for what we're getting ready to talk about in this, in this unit. Hydraulic pressure is just that, it's pressure. Now you've all felt that if you've been swimming. If you're swimming and you go underwater, the deeper you go, the more pressure you feel. In fact, I kind of hate uh, diving, for example, because I'm fat and so I go really deep. And when I get down really deep, 
it is really a problem. Uh, my ears just really ache. I don't, I don't like it being down there. Um, the deeper I go, in fact, like you take a submarine deep enough, it can actually, the hydraulic pressure can crush a submarine if you get deep enough. So there's weight there that pushes down. And that same thing happens in the soil. It's maybe not as dramatic because it's only a few inches, but it's enough to push water. So, so what we're doing here is if I've got a hole and I'm down here and it's saturated, water is not moving inside of the hole as long as I'm in the capillary fringe because the soil is holding onto the water tighter than the hydraulic pressure. There's, there's enough suction that it's, it's, it's holding that, even though there's hardly any suction at all, there's, there's a little bit there that's just kind of holding on to it. But when we get into the free water zone at the bottom of that saturation, there's enough hydraulic pressure that's pushing down that'll actually push water into the hole. So that's, that's, that's the concept. That's a really important concept because it affects whether or not a soil will drain. If I'm trying to put in drains, for example, in a sports field or in a, you know, anywhere, uh, not just a sports field, any, any kind of a field, um, you know, will, will the soil drain? Will it actually move water sideways into the drains? You know, that's a, that's a really important question. And the, and the, the hint is most of the time, not. <laughs> drains usually fail. There's the take home point. And, and we're gonna hit that heavy. All right, now, oof, man, here's your favorite slide, right? In fact, I gotta take a drink of water because I, I'm, I'm starting to get dry mouth here. You notice my cup, you know, super dad. My kids gave that to me. <clears throat> I don't know why they, a couple of them were rolling their eyes when they gave it to me or not. I think I'm super dad. Okay, now we're looking at hydraulic conductivity as it relates to bulk density at four different levels of compaction. So we're, we're starting to throw compaction in here now, which is important, especially in the urban environment. We're dealing with compaction in a lot of cases. We're gonna look at five different soils. Uh, these are actual uh, sports turf facilities and landscaping facilities in Australia. Um, the fines are defined as those particles below 0.1 millimeters. So those are clays and silts and some of the fine sands. Okay, that's what fines are. Okay, so let's just, let's start walking through. Let's look at this top one here. This is, now this top one is a, a, is a USGA, which means United States Golf Association spec sand, which means it was built right in order to create a perch water table system. And it doesn't compact. A USGA sand, you can walk on it even when it's wet and it bridges. And so it doesn't really compact. And so this is excellent type of the, really the best, the, the Cadillac of, uh, of soils in terms of uh, traffic. Um, so uh, we, we're gonna look at here, we're gonna look at hydraulic conductivity in inches per hour, um, and then also in millimeters per hour, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just look at the inches. And then we're looking at the bulk density. If, if you'll remember from soils class, that's, you know, how compact, that's a measure of compaction. Grams per cubic centimeter is how we measure. So like 1.5, for example, that's a pretty good soil. Uh, that's not very compacted. We, we, so, so we take, um, we, they're taking a, 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 a hammer basically and dropping it on the soil, and after four drops of this, um, it's still fine. I still got a good bulk density. Um, I have 68 inches per hour. That is huge. <laughs> that's a that's that's like Noah flood. You know, I mean, we can take a lot of water and it's moving right into that soil, no problem. Now, eight drops, we're getting a little bit of compaction, but hardly any at all. By the time I do 32 drops. I've, went, I've gone from 1.5 bulk density to 1.63. I've dropped from 68 down to about 35 inches per hour, which is still fast, no problem. That is not a problem at all. Okay, now I, I'm not gonna go through all these in the interest of time. You, you're welcome to look at these, but let's go down here to our worst case scenario. This is a heavy silt clay, which is not a good combination of soils. I've got, um, 37% fines, about 28% silt clay ratio, which is not good. We would, we would not like to have that for, especially for a sports turf or any kind of a, of a, of a surface that's getting a lot of traffic. Um, my hydraulic conductivity initially, now initially look at this bulk density, it's lower. Now, now that's kind of normal. Uh, I just remember that sands actually weigh more, they have a higher particle density 
than clays and silts. And so it's kind of normal for them to have a lower bulk density to start with anyway. Um, so, so anyway, 1.42 bulk densities is pretty good. And after four drops, it's still not too bad. And look, I've still got a really pretty nice, uh, you know, this is a new installation. So, you know, it's, everything's loose, but after four drops of the hammer, uh, we're still at 41.5. But after eight drops, I'm all the way down to five inches per hour. And then, oh my goodness, 16 drops, I'm down to 0.12, 32 drops, I've almost gone to zero. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not moving water. Now, this is not uh, infiltration. I may have even said that incorrectly in at the beginning. This is hydraulic connectivity. This is how fast water is moving through a soil. And so that is extremely slow. If I'm trying to drain this thing, it's not going nowhere, it's just staying wet. All right, now let's get back to our meniscus here. Um, again, if, if, uh, if we have a, a, let's say this is a water tube, you know, I'm sitting, I drop this little straw of water um, uh, in, in, and it's wide, right? So the forces of adhesion and cohesion are, are pulling that water upward uh, along the edges of that thing. And you'll notice that how high the water moves up is related to how narrow the, the tube is. And, and so that same principle works in soils. The, the more narrow the pore spaces, the more uh, farther it'll, it'll move up when it's, and, and when it's in saturated conditions. All right, so let's, let's kind of look at some, some applications of that. So here's a situation where we have taken a, a nine square foot plastic sheet. Um, I love how these guys go back and forth between <laughs> between metric and English units, but whatever. Uh, anyway, nine square foot plastic sheet. And then they, uh, they irrigated the soil. So, so essentially they were keeping water off of this soil. So one of the things that kind of people think about, they're like, oh, well, water's gonna move sideways really easily. Um, it does move sideways, but it doesn't necessarily move easily and it only moves so far. So, so that dry soil, it exerts, force suction on the wet soil. So if I have a dry soil next to a wet soil, now usually that's, you know, I'm sitting like this, but in this case, I'm sitting side by side to demonstrate that this stuff can even, even move water sideways. So I got a saturated soil and a dry soil. So that's dry soil is gonna kind of have a suction. And, and the deeper we go, the, the more the suction will be because of, uh, of that, um, of these concepts. So it, so it sort of moves sideways, but it, it, but it has a limit. It's not gonna move all the way over, it's gonna stop. Eventually it doesn't have the force to continue to move that water over to the side. All right, so why is that important? Well, cause you know, we, so sometimes we have people thinking, well, when I irrigate, it doesn't really matter if my irrigation system doesn't have perfect uniformity because it's just gonna move sideways and just all even out. That kind of happens, but not really. So this demonstrates here that we get some lateral movement, uh, but doesn't go very far. It certainly doesn't even things up. So if, I, if I'm, my sprinkler system is putting on 0.2 inches per hour over in this spot, and over here, let's say I've got a four-way overlap with my sprinklers, and I'm getting 0.6 uh, inches per hour, I'm, I'm pushing water deeper. Um, and, you know, and over here, I'm not. And so that, that's gonna affect things. I'm, things are gonna dry out faster over here where it's 0.2 inches, obviously. So that's a really important concept to understand. Again, water typically is not moving sideways very efficiently in an urban soil. All right, so sometimes we wanna put in drains. I get people wanting to put in drains all the time on new constructions, folks that I work with. And most of the time I'm trying to talk them out of it because they most of the time don't work. Almost every drain system I have ever inspected and worked with was an utter failure. Uh, I am not a fan of drain systems unless they are really needed. And if, and, and, and if they actually work and you build them right and do the math right, which I'm going to teach you how to do. Um, so, uh, so we're going to go here, midpoint between the drains. Let, let's say I put my drains 16.5 um, uh, feet apart. Uh, so the, I'm most interested in the midway point. Why? Well, because water is going to move downward, no problem, right into the drain. So, so this area of soil is going to drain into those drains just fine. But the question is, will the water drain that's in between the two, in the soil between the two drains? That's the question. 
So any water that's up here at point A, it's, it's kind of got to move diagonally, just similar to those previous uh, figures we were looking at. And it, it's, you know, not too steep of a slope. By the time I get down here to C, um, it's really got to move sideways, you know, it pretty, pretty much. Now, if I widen those things out, double them in, in, their, in their width, uh, it's even worse. And so the question is, is will that water move 16 and a half feet over here? It's actually further because it's, it's the hypotenuse of the triangle. So that's the question, you know, is, is how we do that. Um, now, this, this is showing four different sands, particle size distributions. Again, we've got some different types of sands um, in some actual stadiums in Australia. Um, uh, so, so sands A, B, and C have been used, uh, and they are actual, they meet specs. Sand D is one that does not meet specs, has too many fines in it. So let's kind of look at, look at that in particular. Uh, so again, sandy soil, but it has a lot of fines in it. So, so let's just, let's kind of look at, at, you know, this particular thing in terms of how that's built. So sand A has got you know, most of its, of its sand is in this 93, 93% of it is in this particle size range, which is uh, kind of a medium type sand. Sand B is a little wider distribution. And actually, if I'm building, if I'm building a green or a sports field, I kind of like to be a little more like this. And then sand C also meets specs. Um, but, but D is, is a problem because um, I've got, um, I've got too many fines. I've got you know, 41.4 in this particular category. And that's just too, too many. I've got uh, too many fines. Now that's still sand, but it's fine sand. All right, we're gonna come back to that. Uh, again, let's, let's, come, let's talk about this for a second. Water's held in these pores, right? That gravity, you know, just kind of review here. I got the saturated zone. Water's held by the pores, by the surface tension at the top and bottom of the column. Combined effect of the surface tension and the adhesive forces of the soil particles is stronger than the force exerted by gravity. This prevents water from draining out of the bottom, all right? Um, and so that's, if we talk about a perched water table, like in a sand-based golf green, um, that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Again, review from what we've already discussed, but it's pertinent to this, this part of what we're talking about. So when, when the, men the meniscus starts bending and, and, and dro a drop forms, which breaks off and, and falls, when water is added at the top. So, so in my perch water table system, and what that's saying is that if, if it's saturated, um, uh, it's, you know, it's being held up there um, in that perch water zone. Um, if I add a drop, it'll push a drop through. And so it'll drain. Um, and that's kind of how that perch water table system works. It holds water when I need it, but if, it's, if it continues to rain, um, it'll just kind of let it drain. So it's really a cool system with a perch water table um, that's a sand sitting on top of a gravel, uh, which is different than a sand sitting on top of a slow draining base. So that's what we're talking about now, kind of shifted. Um, all right, so let's get, we're continuing to talk about these guys. So what I've got is I've got soil moisture on the x-axis and on the, on the y-axis, um, these are soil mo moisture release curves like we, we've shown you before with the same y-axis. And you can see that um, for soil A, for example, which is that one that's extremely sandy, um, it, it's got uh, lots of uh, you know, suction. It goes down here. As the soil moisture increases, um, its field capacity is actually really narrow. And so, boy, it's, it's really... Um, you know, it's, it's really an issue, but look at the height. It's a, the height of its perch water table is affected by that. Sand B has got a, 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 a field capacity at a higher rate because it's got more fines in it. It's not as, as much medium sand as sand A. So we've, we've affected what percent moisture this is at. This is why every soil texture is a little different in terms of where is the field capacity. Um, you can see that sand C is even, even more so. Look at, look at where its field capacity is sitting at about 11% compared to 4, 8, and 7 uh, with its uh, counterparts here. But you can see these release curves also are affected, the shape, how they're affected. Um, and it affects them whether they're compacted or not compacted. So the, the dotted line is when they're compacted and when they're not compacted. Notice that 
that this sand really doesn't compact. Um, and so its release curve, water release curve is about the same. Uh, this sand D over here though, it, it, it's dramatically affected when it's compacted and it just, it's a mess. Uh, it just doesn't want to move water at that point. All right, so let's, uh, let's come back here and look at this perch water table uh, situation. Again, USGA sand um, is placed over a gravel. It is how we build golf greens, uh, USGA spec, similar for sports fields, except for it's, uh, we call it ASTM spec, which is the American Society of Testing Materials. Um, they're the ones who write the specs for sports fields. And they're about the same though. Similar concept, we've got sand sitting on top of gravel. Uh, we usually have some kind of a, a, a slow draining base. We've typically cut some drain, uh, drain basins in there and drop some pipe. And we'll use this to, so any water that, that does come through the sand and into the gravel will move down into that drain pipe and move away. Uh, so we like that. Um, we get that perched water table. Uh, if we build it to the right height, the sand will really never be saturated at the surface, which allows me to go out there and play golf right after a rainstorm or, or to play football or lacrosse right after a rainstorm because the perch water table holds water at the lower part of the profile for plant roots to get to and be happy, but it's not muddy right at the surface. And that's kind of one of the points of building a perch water table system is to have both um, enough water for plants to grow and to have drainage in, in the case of, of a big rain event. So here's kind of why that works. Um, here's my saturated sand. I, I, it sort of defies logic. You know, we, we, most of us would think, well, if I have sand sitting on top of a gravel, man, that water is just going to run out of the sand into the gravel, right? Uh, it really doesn't because we've got these great big pores in, in the gravel. And, and we, yes, if it's totally saturated all the way to the top, it'll drain. But, but when, it, when we start getting those pore spaces getting opened up uh, with air in them, then we've, we've lost, you know, we've got that, that you know, it, it, those, that it doesn't want to pull water down. And so we get very, very little drainage from the sand into the gravel, unless we get enough hydraulic pressure. If the entire profile of sand is full of water, yeah, then it'll drain. It'll push it through hydraulic pressure, it'll push it down, it'll drain. But, you know, in a normal situation, you know, 24 hours or even two hours after a, a rain event or an irrigation event, you know, it, it's drained and it's just holding the water up. It, it's not draining into the gravel. All right, if we wanna look at drainage rate in the top two inches of a soil profile with free water zones of four inches and eight inches of depth, a hydraulic conductivity of 0.2 inches per hour and an air filled porosity of 15%. Sorry, that's a lot of technical stuff. Drains are spaced at three and a half, 6 6.3, 6.6, and 33 feet apart. So, okay, so we're looking at height. So, in other words, is water moving sideways to those drains or not in this system? Um, so, so, that's what we're looking at here. Um, let's look at the first one. Um, the drains are spaced 33 feet apart. The drainage rate of the topsoil in inches per hour is 0. 0.0002. That is basically nothing. Evaporation is working faster than that. You're not draining. This drain is not working. Time taken to drain the top two inches, this is in, in um, hours and in days, 50 days. <laughs> it's how long it's going to take. Yeah, that's like, you know, that's like half the summer. And it's worthless, pointless to put a drain system in that's going to do that. Now, it's even worse if I only have four inches of, of, uh, of a free water zone, which means I've got a shallower topsoil. Okay, it's even worse. And again, the common, common to have these shallow. So this situation over here on the right, the four inches, that's far more common in the urban environment than it is to have eight inches of free water zone. So, you know, again, lots of technicalities. I'm going to go through some of this math with you later, but um, bottom line is not working. Now, if I put the drains kind of close up to each other, it gets a little better. Um, drains are six and a half, 6.6 .6 feet apart. Um, my drainage rate's a little more reasonable. It's going to take me 48 hours, two days uh, to drain the top two if I've got an eight inch 
free water zone. If I only have a four inch free water zone though, we're talking 10 days. I'm not gonna play football on it tomorrow. It's pointless, uh, you know, it's not working. Okay, what if I put them 3.3? I mean, that, that, that drain is this far apart. It's gonna cost you a fortune to put in that drain system. Uh, 0 0.025 uh, at eight inches, which is 12 hours. Um, uh, you know, so, so yeah, that's more reasonable. Um, at four inches, you know, it's, it's 60. So kind of the best case scenario, three and a half feet apart, um, you know, yeah, I'll drain it in two and a half days. That still ain't good enough for sports and golf. You know, maybe that's good enough for other things, but certainly not. It's like, why are you even putting in a drain system? It's not working. So th this is a great table to demonstrate that. Here's another table that's really revealing. Drainage rate in the top two inches, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, same kind of thing here, same setup with the distances uh, and also the heights of the free water zone. Um, so what, so the, the difference here is, is I've got, um, I've changed the air filled porosity. Um, so I've, I've changed the initial hydraulic conductivity. So it's a different soil type basically. Um, so, uh, you know, a little more reasonable if, if I have, you know, I've, I've got a little bit different soil that's got a little bit better uh, air filled porosity. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at worst case scenario though still is 17 days and, um, and 83 days here. So even then, even though it's a better soil, it's still kind of a dumpster fire um, unless I put these drains really close together. So not, not really working still. Uh, here's another one. Now my air filled porosity is 25%. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at, you know, uh, eight days, worst case scenario, um, you know, half a day over here uh, with, if I'm, so getting better, getting better with different types of soil, but still not great. All right, let's shift gears just a little bit. Um, sometimes we get th these, th this perched water working um, or even moving through gravel layers, like in this case, you know, water will, uh, we get these seeps, you know, we, we see them, we see natural springs in the mountains, you know, it happens in nature. We, we get it, it's sometimes like here in this case, we got a hill and we got some water that's moving through. We got an example at BYU, you know, water moving down from the hills down to our, uh, duck pond that's uh, west of the life sciences building. Um, so water will move through that gra gravel layer and then where it comes in contact with the surface, it'll form a wet spot just like we have in the duck pond. Now, if I'm trying to play sports there, I don't wanna have a pond, uh, how do I get rid of that? Well, I, ca I, can, um, uh, I can deal with that water that's moved through that subterranean aquifer and intercept it before it reaches the, by building this, this drain right here. Now it has to go all the way to the surface and I can put it in a drain pipe. Now the drain pipe's got to have somewhere to go to take the water, but it'll it'll dry up the playing surface so I don't have a wet spot. Now, if I do want to build uh, a drain system, and we can, we can build them, you know, especially like in a USGA spec or ASTM spec uh, sand-based field, uh, they'll work. Or, or if I've got really deep soil, it'll work. Um, like in a farm field, I mean, we put drains in farm fields, but we're talking really deep soils that we don't typically have in the urban environment. So if I do want to do it, there's some things that are important to follow in terms of how we build drains. Um, we, we have a main line that goes, a main drain that, a pipe that goes through. It has to be the right sizes and all that stuff is in this book. And, you know, we, you know, we're not going to go through that in depth, but you have to make sure the drain pipe's big enough to handle the water you want to move through. We like this herringbone design with these uh, coming off these uh, laterals that are coming off, you wouldn't want to put them parallel because that creates a, a vortex inside the main and it drops out a uh, silt and stuff. So any, any kind of fines that make their way into the drains, we want them to move out of the system instead of getting, uh, instead of getting deposited in the pipes. So in order to do that, to keep the drains clean, we need, to, we need to have this herringbone design. And then we want to have alternating entry points. We don't want the herringbones entering at the same spot. We, we alternate them as, as shown here in this uh, diagram. Okay, so um, another thing that's interesting that we see a lot in the urban environment is we do a lot of raised bed work, right? And sometimes we'll put uh, drains underneath a raised bed, which can be really effective actually. And so a lot of times the hydraulic conductivity in a raised bed, you know, you got kind of potting soil type mix and with really good hydraulic conductivity, unlike most soils. 
Um, it, so drains in, in these raised beds can actually work really effectively, uh, unlike most uh, typical soils. Um, so here's one configuration with the drain in the middle of it. The, the two edges kind of act as drains anyway. Um, so that's, you know, you, in terms of my calculations, we actually calculate the edges of, as being a drain when we're doing the math on this kind of stuff. Um, here, here's, a, a, you know, kind of an interesting scenario too. Of, you know, we, we have a slope, we put a drain at the bottom of the slope, and we'll do uh, some calculations later on this. All right, uh, here's a table with some interesting values. Um, recommended coarse washing sand to be used as a filter material around the sub drains. So, so if we look at these drains, we want to backfill them with something. We probably don't want to put regular soil in there. We want a gravel or a sand inside there to kind of keep them free flowing. They kind of act as sort of a drain pipe themselves. And so we have to have the right kind of material as backfill in those, uh, in those, uh, around those drains. So here, here's some, uh, some sand sizes that we would want to uh, adhere to for that. Um, recommended gravel, if we're going to use that, um, and, and typically that's what we actually prefer in most cases uh, for like a USGA STM spec uh, drain, drain system would be to uh, fit this, these specs. Uh, so here's kind of a diagram of that um, water entering the drain pipe. So I got the sand, I've got my gravel here, and I've got my gravel surrounding my drain pipe. Now you need to realize that these drain pipes we actually, they're, they have, they're perforated, so there's little holes in them, and um, the water, is, the, the holes go on the bottom, not on the top. Uh, that's counterintuitive. You're like, wait, you know, then the, it's, it's a leaky pipe. It's like, yeah, no, the, the, the drain fills up from the bottom, so we want to orient the holes at the bottom of the pipe, and the water fills up, and then when it gets up into the drain, it starts going down the pipe, so that's how that works. Now, Let's talk about um, what's really important is surface drainage. Surface drainage is the key. I hate subsurface drainage. Most of the time it doesn't work. I very rarely put it in. I very rarely recommend it. Even in places though, where I do recommend it, uh, I, I like to typically have some kind of surface drainage, which means I need to have slopes, slopes of at least 1%. Now on a playing field, that becomes a, a bit of a challenge because we don't typically want to have too steep of a slope. Um, so we also want to think about how these things are, are oriented. There's a weird phenomenon, a physics phenomenon that we, we've got about a maximum slope distance of about 76 yards. At about 76 yards, I start getting this vortex thing happen and I get stuff that falls out and we form problem areas on these fields. And so, for example, over here on the left, this field is, is sloping toward, instead of sloping side to side, which is typically what we recommend, this one is sloped down, you know, one end's higher than the other. The top is higher than the bottom. And so this slope is about 76 yards. And then right there in front of that, uh, you know, goal, uh, we're getting a problem area um, that, that really becomes a problem. Um, in this case, I've got two fields that are sitting side by side. It's highest over here on the right, and it's sloping downward across. So we get the same thing. I got 76 yards, and I'm forming this problem right here at 76 yards. Uh, we get the same thing in, in a golf green. Now, so typically, these are areas where there's lots of traffic, right? So, so most of the time, it's, it's playing fields. Um, it could be this way in the other environments. Usually, though, I'm not too worried about these kinds of things in uh, you know, a normal landscape. Um, you usually don't have that much traffic. But if I have a lot of traffic, I need to realize and kind of avoid crossing traffic at these 76 yard marks. Now, here's kind of a diagram of some different types of things. We have a concept called a mowable drain. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, we, we want to put in a mowable drain. You know, here, here's, here's a field like you know, that we, we basically got the highest point in the middle. So it's kind of uh, mounded in the middle and, and everything. So if it rains real heavy, I got surface drainage going all directions. Uh, here's another one where it's uh, a little different shape. Here's another one where it's going side to side. So those are all effective drains. Um, here's one where it's going side to side, but we're gonna put in mobile drain. 
Now, what do I mean by a mobile drain? Well, it means I'm just, I'm just putting in a drain pipe right in between these two fields. So like here, for example, I've got four fields that are sitting side by side. Um, and, and so this is, this is the top view right here. This is the side view. So this field is, is sloped this way. So any water that comes on is gonna drain downward here and it's gonna you know, puddle up over here on the sideline. This one is gonna, is gonna instead, of, instead of running them together, both sloping the same direction, we're just sloping this one towards the middle along with this guy doing the same thing. And now I don't wanna have a big puddle down there. Uh, so in order to avoid the puddle, I put in a drain pipe, just one, not with all those laterals, just one pipe right down the middle that, that's, that's mobile. And I, and I can uh, basically, you know, I, I can just run the pipe with sand up to the surface um, and then the water comes in, goes through the sand down into the drain. Um, here's, here's a, again, another uh, figure that shows slopes deflecting water on a fairway, similar kind of concepts. Here's an example of what um, of some of these drains might look like. Um, in this particular case, we're 3.3 3 or 6.6 .6 feet apart. Um, I, I, so this is my regular soil in between the drains. Um, but where I have the drains, I've got sand backfilled all the way to the, the surface. If I don't do that, the water won't move into there. It has to be at the surface. Um, if I have clay or loam sitting on top of sand, the water will move into the clay and it won't move into the sand. It'll just move around it if it even moves at all, just stay wet and be a disaster. So I have to have sand all the way to the surface and, and this can become a, a sand trench that we can, again, you can make a mobile drain uh, for, uh, for, us, for situations where I need to move water. So, and I do like those types of situations. I'm not really depending, let me back up. I'm not really depending on the subsurface system draining the field. I'm dra that's being drained with surface drainage, but it's, it's going to these spots that are then collecting the water and moving them off. So that's the difference. Th these kind of drains work. Uh, here's another one of a typical design with laterals running you know, across the slope, feeding a large collector drain. So you can kind of do the same kind of concept here. Here's, a, here's another view. This is a trench with gravel in the bottom that perches the water table and prevents the top from drying out. So one of the problems with this design is that that sand can get kind of dry and you can get some, you can sometimes see it. Uh, you get these little streaks across the field wherever, you're, wherever your drain is. Um, you can kind of avoid that. It's a little more complex to install but essentially you're creating a perch water table system, just like we do in a green. Um, so this is more common. You know, a lot of folks are never gonna build a golf green or a sports field, but this, this is the same concept and it's, it's a drain that's used in all kinds of landscapes. Um, it's only, you know, six inches wide or maybe eight inches wide. Um, I, I put the drain pipe at the bottom, surround it with gravel. I put my sand on top and then I use a wash sod. Why do I use a wash sod? Because if I bring in sod that's got a bunch of loam on it or clay, it, the water is not going to move from that down into the sand. So I walk, so if I buy my sod, I actually pressure wash the soil off of it and then plant it there and allow it to root down into the sand so that I don't get a clay or loam cap sitting on top of my sand. Now, when I build these things, it's important that they're not mounded because that'll be a problem if, if I got this mound and leave it like that. Uh, no, it, need, it really needs to be the same thing. So I want to put the sand in. I want to kind of compact it when I'm installing it. And then I want to blade it off so that it's flat and even. These things do take maintenance. They, they'll they fail after about five years. So you sometimes you have to go in there, cut the grass off and reinstall the top inch or two. Um, this shows uh, 18 inch wide slit drain which installed in between two football fields. Again, collecting um, all that surface runoff that's, that's being surface runoff from the fields being collected in this, in this uh, slit drain uh, before it reaches the bottom of the field. Um, so the profile in the trench is the same as what you just saw. So cutoff or French drains will not drain the, the surface if they are covered with soil finer than the backfill material. Um, here's, a, here's a little diagram. Um, you know, it's, it's really important to, um, you know, to, to build these things right. Um, uh, we call it a French drain. It's, it's really critical to to be able to collect it. Um, you can also use these things, like, like I said, to drain seeps and even groundwater. Uh, if I've got wet spots in the field, I've got a 
field I'm working on up by the Great Salt Lake where it's got a really high water table in some years. And so we're using this thing in a dry environment, not so much to take, to move rainwater off, but to actually use high water table or to move high water table away. So, um, so uh, bottom line is, is that uh, drains uh, don't, don't commonly work. Um, subsurface drains, water doesn't usually move sideways. Uh, I'll, I'll go through some math later uh, with you uh, during class in terms of how to figure all that out. But this gives you a nice introduction to these ideas that, that water doesn't move sideways very, that's a take home point. Most of the time we're not putting in a drain system throughout a whole thing. Now, if I wanna put in collector drains, like I talked about that works, I definitely wanna think about surface drainage and, and moving my water that way, which is, can be very effective if I have the right slopes and I'm building this thing right. So that, that, those are the take home points for this whole thing. I hope it was interesting and I'm sorry it was so brutally long. I forgot to show you my funny slides. Here we go. When Dr. Hopkins says there's a hundred more slides, there's not. Uh, anyway, um, I kind of blew my punchline, but that took so long to record that I am not going to do it again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hopkins out. <laughs>